even though I was so boringly average in my experiments, I do know that some of the work that Richard has done has come up with some quite remarkable results. But the point is that neither he nor anybody else yet knows why. It may be that at some time in the future he'll come up with something extraordinary that makes us have to completely rethink our understanding of the mind. On the other hand, maybe this whole business is a scientific cul-de-sac. But at the moment, they're just in the foothills. They're not about to come up with something world-shattering like Einstein and Newton and Galileo did. And that is the exact opposite of the way Dan Brown describes this kind of work in his book. His noetic science just isn't stacking up. So what about the amazing laboratories back in DC? They must be real. In the book, our heroine Catherine Solomon has her world-leading noetic laboratory at the Smithsonian Museum Support Center. I'm back in Washington, and that is where I'm going. The book says that the Smithsonian Support Center is at the cutting edge of noetic research. Well, it's actually situated in the outskirts of DC, and it's a complex that houses the museum's overspill collection. Catherine works in a sealed and sterile hangar called Pod 5. It's full of amazing machines like random event generators, which help her to understand the incredibly powerful forces that lie latent in the human mind. While Catherine is in here about to make some important scientific announcements that will in fact change the course of human history, the bad guy is outside trying to get in, determined to destroy all her work at any cost. This I've got to see. This is just like I imagined it would be from the book, Liz. What's in here? We have 55 million different things in here, so a lot of variety. What kind of stuff? Well, most of it's from the National Museum of Natural History, so things like plants and rocks and stuffed animals and skeletons. And do you really store it in pods? Yes, we have five storage pods. Can we see one? Yes, you can. That's in the book. Pod four. No turning back now. I can feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. Look at this. Is this real? Yes, it is. Black rhinoceros taken with a bow and arrow. Some arrow. This is amazing. Dan Brown talks about a canoe just like that in the book. This is the real deal. Why have you got a big cat on a shopping trolley? It's in here getting a little refurbishment. Um, one of my staff has added some fur here and she's repainted the mouth. She's still working on the teeth and did a little cleaning. You don't have a giant squid, do you? We do, but it's in a different pod. No wonder Dan Brown's heroine chose this place for her secret research. It's a real Aladdin's cave. Oh, this is, this is absolutely amazing. In the book, Catherine's assistant, Trish, gets murdered in this great big case with the giant squid in it. The baddie chucks her in at the top. He forced down, kicking and screaming, trying to remove the ethanol which is flooding into her lungs, but she fails absolutely and dies amid a tangle of tentacles. That's right, isn't it? Well, in the book, she did die in a tank like this, but that's an octopus. It doesn't matter. This is, this is just as near as you could possibly get. What about pod five? Where's pod five? You're in pod five. But pod five is gigantic and empty. No, it's gigantic, but it's completely full. We have 25 million specimens in here. What about the cube that Catherine does all her work in? No, we don't have a cube. So where do you do your noetics? We don't do noetics here. Nothing to do with mind over matter? No. Any spoon bending? No, but we do study squid. This is disaster. I was brought up so high in the air with a giant squid, and the next minute they come crashing to the ground because pod five isn't what we thought it was, the cube isn't here, and you don't do any noetics. 
No, and we don't have Trish in a tank either. Oh, come on. Another damp squid. It would seem that almost nothing of Dan Brown's book that we've investigated is quite as factual as he makes out. But what of Brown's assertion that even today, the Masonic ranks are stuffed with the great and the good? A state secret that must be preserved at all costs, or the entire edifice of American society will come crashing to the ground. Do the Freemasons really rule the world? I'm sure the answer lies in the House of the Temple, just a few blocks from the White House. The lost symbol climaxes in this very building. Our baddie is inside, trying to leak the covert video he shot of his own initiation ceremony. Featuring sinister death threats and disturbing rituals, it also shows the faces of rich and powerful Freemasons, including senators and the CIA director. If it gets out to the press, it threatens to bring the government crashing down. If anyone knows the truth, it's Brent Morris, one of the highest ranking Masons in the United States. I ask if the Masonic ranks are full of the rich and powerful. While we are indeed extremely proud of, of members that we've had, the 14 presidents of the United States and the astronauts we've, we've had, the fact is that uh, nearly all Masons are uh, from the middle class. Does it bother you that an organization which was once so radical, both here and in Europe, is now almost the epitome of conservative middle class America? That is one of the ironies of Freemasonry. Uh, we were a cutting edge organization, um, uh, feared by the church, feared by the state, because we espouse such radical principles as representative democracy, freedom of speech, and universal education. And today, you're, you're right, we are the epitome of middle class. Are you part of a big global plot? Tony, I'll tell you the truth. If we can't agree on what to serve at our ladies' banquet, it's hard to imagine we'd do, be very effective in taking over the world. Have a good tour, Tony. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. I finished my journey with a guided tour of lost symbol locations. After 12,000 carbon offset air miles, I'm right back where I started, empty-handed and without a jot of a lost symbol. It's been an entertaining romp. I've explored every nook and cranny of this city looking for Masonic clues. But to be honest, I've been frustrated at just about every turn. I think it's time to go home. So, what have I learned from the world's fastest selling novel of all time? Well, the monuments and the organisations may be real, but as for the rituals and the science, I think he's taken more than just a little bit of artistic licence there, don't you? I cannot find one piece of ancient knowledge anywhere, although there is plenty of mumbo jumbo. And as for the way he treats the Masons, well, the ones I've met over here have been rather sweet. Not my cup of tea at all, personally, but hardly a threat to humanity. Now, if I have a big beef with Dan Brown, it's this. He was lazy. Why did he choose the Masons as the basis of a modern conspiracy thriller? It's been done before. But more importantly, why didn't he do what novelists are supposed to do? Make up a story and then tell it to us, instead of pretending it's all real. Having said that, I wonder who he'll have a go at next time. The Boy Scouts, maybe? Morris Dancers? The Women's Institute? I can't wait. Tony's mission of discovery continues with his original quest to find the real Da Vinci Code. That's next tonight on 4. Tomorrow night from 7, how can religious belief be reconciled with natural disaster? Tsunami, where was God? <laughs>